Welcome to This One Life. Today on the show, Professor Dr. Michael Zorders. Michael is a distinguished academic with more than 60 publications in the field of exercise science. He completed his PhD in exercise physiology from the Florida State University and is a full professor and the department chair at the Department of Exercise Science and Health Promotion at Florida Atlantic University. He's also a managing partner in the Mass Research Review. We will discuss something incredibly important today, resistance training proximity to failure. Meaning, do you have to go all out until muscle failure when hitting the gym? In some cases, it's not necessary. In other cases, it can even be detrimental. Expect to get great scientific background as well as important practical implications. This is part one of the conversation, and we will follow up with a deep dive on exercise and cognition, the surprising impact of mental fatigue on exercise performance, as well as how resistance training alone can make you smarter. Enjoy. Michael, great to have you on the show. It's great to be here, Daniel. I really appreciate the invitation. Let's jump into a controversial topic. One of those bro signs, generational wisdom things, no pain, no gain in resistance training. You need to go all out for real progress. As an introduction to help us understand the playing field, what is proximity to failure and repetitions in reserve? Yeah, so it's it's always funny to me that this is a controversial topic, right? There's so many controversial things in the world. Um, you'd think that uh, how close you train to failure and resistance training wouldn't be one of those. Um, it's not exactly a, a geopolitical issue, but... Uh, nonetheless, it, it does tend to be something that people get worked up about. And and one thing before I get into the definition is, although I, I, I joke about that, I do understand because any time that you, you have something that you do, and that's kind of part of your identity and training, or it's, it's really what you do, and you're really focused on that, and you've done that for a year, for five years, for 10 years, and then someone comes at this from another direction, it's almost like, well, well, wait a second. I, I've, I've built my whole kind of programming strategy on this, and now I feel like that's being, being attacked or challenged. And I, I also see that a lot of people have made really, really good progress training to failure, and a lot of people have made really, really good progress not training to failure. So anecdotally, there are really good results on both sides of this. And so... I think that is in part what's creating a lot of the confusion or tribalism in those camps, which is that people have seen good results in both ways. And not to kind of put a uh, damper on this or just take a middle ground, and we'll get to all of this, but I don't think it's surprising that people have seen really good results on both sides of it, because I think the data do show that both are effective. So with that little preamble out of the way, to answer your question and to give the definitions of what is proximity to failure, and then what is repetitions in reserve. So proximity to failure, how we're defining it here is how close someone takes a set to failure in resistance training. And the way you measure that is the second part of this, which is repetitions in reserve. Now, repetitions in reserve is essentially you finish a set, and then you think, hey, how many more reps could I have done until absolute failure? And you say, all right, I could have done two more reps. So you can measure the proximity to failure by two more reps. Now we call that RIR for short or repetitions in reserve. Now there is a lot of nuance with that, which is worth getting into. But also when we define proximity to failure, it's, it's more than just taking the number of repetitions in reserve because and this is one of the issues, and I'm sure we'll get into this, Daniel, but one of the issues with how the literature is interpreted and with even with designing research, because not all definitions of failure are the same. You have momentary muscular failure and momentary muscular failure means training to when somebody actually fails on a repetition. 
So you're tr you do 10 reps and then on that 11th rep, you actually fail. And then there is volitional failure. Volitional, meaning somebody stops upon their own accord, their own volition. And you say, all right, I want you to do as many reps as you can, but stop when you don't think you have anymore. Well, just because somebody stops because they don't think they have anymore doesn't mean that they actually don't have anymore, right? They might stop after nine reps and say, ah, that was it. But it's possible they could have still had two more repetitions in reserve. And so we have to always give that caveat because when we get into discussing in, in a moment, what the literature says on this topic. We have to understand that we are really only estimating somebody's proximity to failure in the literature. So to bring that all around, and I know there was a lot there, to answer those two questions, what is proximity to failure and what is repetitions in reserve? It makes sense to answer what is repetitions in reserve first, which is just simply using and stating at the end of a set, I had one more rep, two more reps, three more reps, or so forth, and making sure that the terms of that are clear. So two more reps in reserve until what? Till momentary muscular failure, right? Let's use that. And then what is proximity to failure? Proximity to failure is how close somebody trains, let's say again, to absolute momentary muscular failure in terms of repetitions in reserve. So, and then the question is, is training to momentary muscular failure, is training to a one RIR, is training to a three RIR, is training to a five RIR, do those elicit different adaptations or do they tend to elicit similar adaptations? When you talk about the definition of repetitions in reserve and you know for example momentary muscle failure do you all how do you think about the difference between for lack of a better word the the, the technical failure so i'm not able to hold form anymore versus muscle of failure which at least for me personally likely technical failure would happen before actual real muscle failure um and as a second question, if you def when you define repetitions, repetitions in reserve, how about if I do a three seconds pause in between? So on the bench press, you know, I keep my my elbows locked up, or on the deadlift, I just stand there with with um, hanging with hanging arms. Yeah, so it's a great question. To answer your question directly, uh, I think that that subjectivity does come into play. Somebody has to be careful first and foremost about are they accurate with their ratings or are they accurate enough? And then understanding the parameters of how they're using it. Does technical failure matter? I would say yes, it does, but it's probably more important on certain exercises where you could open yourself up to injury. These more multi-joint, more highly skilled movements on the more single joint movements, I think you can go a bit more toward momentary muscular failure um, in terms of the scale or if you're off a little bit on your rating or if you break your technique a little bit. If it's not an exercise that produces a lot of risk in terms of opening yourself up to injury, that's okay. So I think the answer there is exercise dependent. Michael, really appreciate the depth of your answer. If you allow me to go on social media headline level here just for a second, because I think that still for a lot of people, this is news that there is an actual debate about whether going to momentary muscle failure is the quote unquote best for becoming stronger, muscle hypertrophy, that at least within the broader population in Europe is not common knowledge. It's quite the contrary. It is this, hey, you need to train until you're all out. It's rather, hey, can I have a gym spotter that helps me to get another, you know, rep in then, hey, I could stop, you know, at one or two repetitions in reserve, w whatever, and in what circumstances, I'm sure we're going to get um, in, into, into the weeds in a second. But I just want to highlight this for the, for the listener, that that is absolutely not the case, that that's automatically better. Um, and I, I had a guest on a couple of weeks ago, and we talked about a psychological phenomenon we did not tie it to resistance training in that episode but it might be um 
it might be something that's fitting here because before for the preparation for this episode i thought about hey you know what's the reason why some people um are, why why people are so much in in one camp or the other camp so why there's some controversy around that and i think one thing is it's very intuitive to think yeah if i go on if i'm all out you know the the muscle stimulus is is higher and and all of these kind of things um but the other thing that we have discussed was that a lot of people experience in their life that great results before achieving them you had to work very hard so the brain makes a connection between very hard work and great results and that goes so far that sometimes the brain jumps directly in, instead of rewarding the great results it re rewards the hard work and so doing hard work gives you a dopamine hit and not only does doing hard work give you a dopamine hit but if you achieve something without having gone all out in your effort you feel like you could have done more you could have done better this was not um this was not worth it so any thoughts on my admittedly bro science uh, way to give some additional reasons why it's so polarizing between do you go all out or do you even consider um leaving anything in reserve yeah, I, I think it's a great question. I, so I was just jotting some notes down while you were making those points because I, I want to try to not forget anything because I, I think there's a lot to say. So first and foremost, and as we said at the outset, I, I really do understand uh, people on both sides, you know, saying, hey, you know, how, how could you possibly say that not training to failure is as good? It makes a lot of sense. And I, I think when I started training, I was kind of in that way as well, thinking, well, why, if I, ca I can do more, why wouldn't I do more? Why wouldn't I put that effort in to do more? Clearly, that's going to make me better. And there's a lot of merit on the other side of the argument as well. And in fairness to both camps, I think the research is kind of, you know, ambiguous uh, and, and reasonable scientists can and do disagree, not only on if you should train to failure in some contexts, but the proximity to failure in which you train. So I'm going to get to the psychology component, but the, the first thing I want to say is that it's, that's the, the first question is, is not training to failure as good as training to failure? Then if, if yes, how far from failure can you train? and still maximize your progress is one repetition in reserve better than two repetitions in reserve and so forth. So I think that's a question. And then we have to answer that question for both hypertrophy and strength, and they're probably not the same answer. So I think we need to get into that. But to answer the question of the psychology of it, uh, I, I think as we said, there's a lot to that and in, in, in how somebody you know, can perceive training to failure. The one thing, and I use this terminology, which is, you know, if I can train harder, and I would challenge those that think training to failure is really training harder uh, than not training to failure. Because the other, the other thing to keep in mind is when we're asking this question, is training to failure better? We're really asking it on a volume equated basis, a per set basis. So if somebody's doing 10 reps to failure um, versus uh, using that same load and doing seven reps to maybe three repetitions in reserve, well, one of the possible advantages of that is you're not quite as fatigued each set. Therefore, you could maybe add additional sets to your session, or you could recover more quickly and train again more frequently and do more volume that way. So somebody could argue that you actually have the potential capability to do more total work by not training to failure. And that could be putting more actual effort in, in the gym. The other thing I would say is, and I get, I get the mindset, right? Cause I have been very much of the mindset. And I think I can argue both sides of this, that I can do more. I got to do more. No questions asked. I'm going to turn the music up a little louder. Nothing matters right now, other than knocking out these last sets. Right. But in, in that case, I think we have to question too, if we think from a psychology perspective is, is that sustainable all the time? So even if that is a good idea, is that really sustainable all the time, every set 
every exercise, every session to go ahead and do that. I'd also say that, and I was talking with somebody about this uh, just yesterday, actually, which is that, and getting back to the, is it, is it the harder thing to do more work to go to failure each set? Well, sometimes the harder thing to do to be more disciplined is to know when to pull back. I'm sure there's many out there listening to this or watching this, and I've been in this camp for many, many years. You know you should take an off day. You know you're a little bit injured, but you don't do it. You, you wake up, all right, I'm not going to train today. My shoulder's a little banged up. All of a sudden, it loosens up, loosens up after lunch, after work, and you're like, I feel okay. I'm going to do it. And then you go and you do, uh, you get into the gym, you do a couple sets and you think, ah, terrible decision. Shouldn't have done it. I'm definitely not going to train tomorrow. You wake up. It's a little stiff. You go through the day. It's a little better. I'm going to go again. Same thing happens. So in that situation, there is only, there are downsides to doing what we would think of as working harder and putting in that extra effort. But there's no downside to taking that day off. But in reality, the harder thing to do is to take that day off. For a lot of people, the harder thing to do is to back off and not go to failure. So I think because you could potentially do more work by not going to failure, and because it is kind of psychologically more difficult in some ways to not go to failure, that I, I would I would push back say is it really more difficult I get I understand that physically it's more effort right physically it's more effort but I think it's a it's a difficult distinction to make um, and I I think it takes a lot more discipline to understand when you can pull back because the easy thing is I feel great let's go I'm gonna crush it today right the harder thing is to pull back a little bit so. And then there's the aspect of it of, and I know we haven't gotten into the data yet of saying, you know, what does the science say? But there's the, the aspect of it of just simple enjoyment. And I have answers I would give that if the goal is to maximize strength or maximize hypertrophy, I might recommend this or that. But if somebody just generally wants to get bigger and stronger and they really enjoy training to failure, and that's something that allows them to get into the gym more, they adhere to training more, um, they're excited about training, then should they train to failure? Absolutely, because that's what they enjoy doing. That's what they want to do. Conversely, if somebody prefers to train the other way and they keep going back to the gym because they enjoy you know, stopping a few reps shy, feeling good when they leave the gym, but not feeling completely trashed, then they should do that. So I think there's so much on the psychological aspect of, hey, this is what I've been doing for so long. Like this is now being challenged. Like I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not having it. And I think we're all there with different things in our life, whether it's related to training or not. I know there's, there's beliefs that I've held and, and when they're first presented to me in an opposite way, my first re reaction is which just, just take it easy. You know, that's, I, I've been doing this for a long time, right? Um, and then sometimes you come around to it later and you realize that you were off base. So there's that aspect of it. There's the enjoyment aspect of it. There's the thought of, you know, is this more effort? And I think you can deal with that on both sides. So I'll pause there on that. And then, you know, when you're ready, we can get to the actual, to the data portion. But I think the psychology of it is a, certainly a big component. Uh, well, Thank you for pointing out that there are so many different dimensions to consider when discussing repetitions in reserve. We've talked about the psychological aspects. Then the other very important distinction is, do you just look at this one set or do you look at multiple sets, multiple days over longer time? Because there are other factors that then um, play, into, uh, play into this. Before going into the data, is there anything more from a biological perspective, from a biological understanding that would be helpful for the listeners as background to understand before going into, hey, and this is actually what science says, and then as a step afterwards, okay, how can we think about now individually for myself, what do I need to consider when deciding for, uh, for a target um, um, rep and reserve? For sure. So here's the, the basic theory on why 
the training to failure or training closer to failure would be more effective for muscle growth specifically, not for strength, but for muscle growth specifically than training shy of failure or training far from failure. So typically we have two main types of muscle fibers. Type one fibers, which are not super powerful, but they take a long, long time to fatigue. So they're very dense with mitochondria and capillaries, and they take a long time to fatigue. Then we have type two fibers, which fatigue more quickly, but are more powerful. Within type two fibers, we can think there are more than two subtypes, but let's say there's two main subtypes, which is 2A and 2X. So if we think of the spectrum of type one, type 2A, and 2X, all the way on one end is type one, all the way on the other end is 2X. 2X are the most powerful, but they fatigue the most quickly. Type one, they are the least powerful, but they take a long time to fatigue. And if we think of like most powerlifters and, and bodybuilders, they're gonna be more in the type 2A uh, type of range, right? So they, they're they kind of in the middle there. They do have some power. Um, they have some resistance to fatigue, but not nearly as much as type one and more resistance to fatigue than 2X. And so typically uh, what we think of is that all, Although all those fibers can grow, the type two fibers we think of have a, a greater propensity to grow and change. And so you wanna be able to recruit the theory being all of those muscle fibers. And that way, if you fatigue all of them, they have the greatest propensity to grow. And so when we lift weights, we're looking at recruiting those muscle fibers or recruiting more specifically high and low threshold motor units. A motor unit is a motor neuron and all of the muscle fibers that it innervates. Now, that motor neuron can innervate some type one and some type two fibers, but mostly motor neuron will innervate type one fibers, and that's called low threshold motor units. Or a motor neuron will innervate type two fibers, let's say 2A, and that's a high threshold motor unit. So typically, when we go through a set or a muscle contraction, these motor units are recruited sequentially. That means that the type one are recruited first, and then as those fatigue, the type two are recruited as needed. So if you are just going to uh, uh, do the barbell, an empty barbell, somebody who could you know, max squat 200 kilos, 441 pounds, and they would do an empty 20 kilo barbell, and they would do 10 reps, they're not recruiting really any type two motor units. So that is not a, we would say that's not a sufficient hypertrophy stimulus. So as you go through a set of 12 reps to failure, somebody would say on those first six reps or whatever it might be, that's not a sufficient hypertrophy stimulus because all of these type two fibers have yet to be recruited, or at least they're not all fatigued yet, right? We want to fatigue all of them and we want to maximize our muscle growth by doing that. And so that's the theory behind it. Why saying going to failure would be the way to go. Going to a one RIR would be better than a two RIR because you're recruiting and fatiguing more fibers at a, type, a one than a two. The other aspect of, so let's say, um, just to also explain type one, if somebody is doing a set uh, of only one rep or two reps, and that set is to failure. Yes, all of the fibers should be recruited, but type one, remember, take a long time to be fatigued. So you might not be maximizing the growth potential of the type one in that case, because although you're training to failure, it's only two reps, and the type one are resistant to fatigue for a bit longer, even though they're not as powerful. So that's why a moderate to high rep set so the old adage for the hypertrophy range, the moderate to high rep set and to failure because it's going to recruit all of those motor units and it's going to fatigue not only the type two because we can't then produce enough strength to overcome the force of the barbell, thus we're training to failure, and because those type one fibers are not only recruited, but the set itself is of a long enough duration to fatigue those type one. So that's the theory, and the theory is sound in that case for why the moderate to high rep sets training to failure would be uh, beneficial for hypertrophy. So I'll stop there. I'll, I'll, I have all the data to get through, but I wanna make sure there's no follow-up questions or that that makes sense before moving on. The, uh, that makes perfect sense, thank you. The one question that I would have is then, what would be the theory 
why there could be cases where not training to failure would be beneficial. Sure. And so I don't, I don't know if there is a, a theory for why not training to failure for muscle growth would necessarily be more beneficial from a me mechanistic perspective. But the theory, I'll answer this in two parts, because I think there's, the, let's take the hypertrophy component and then the strength component. So I would say that if we, we would say that, that hypertrophy is going to be most uh, contingent on mechanical tension. So meaning volume. Now, even if you're stopping a rep or two shy of failure, that's probably not enough difference in volume, right? To lead to differential changes in hypertrophy. So I always harp on this a lot when talking about hypertrophy, because anytime there's a difference in something that even if it's really, really small, somebody says, oh, well, you should do this because that's going to lead to greater fatigue of motor units or more volume. I say possibly, but is that really enough to cause a difference in hypertrophy? Now, the other aspect of that too is, and I, I alluded to this earlier, from a, just not a mechanistic perspective, but just a practical perspective, somebody might be less fatigued, feel a bit fresher. So their next set, those reps are of better quality. They are, are fit, uh, their recovery time occurs more quickly. They can get back into the gym a little bit sooner. Maybe they can add more sets in that session. So practically, somebody could say, hey, you might actually achieve more volume by not training to failure on every single set. And if you tr use the same load, let's say on every set, and you take 100 kilograms for 10 reps to absolute failure, well, in that case, you're probably on the next set, maybe going to get six reps, absolute failure, next set, four or five reps. If you train, so let's say we do, you know, we're about 20, 21 reps there total. Let's say you do eight reps on the first set, you probably can get, you have two repetitions in reserve, you can probably get eight reps on the next two, right? And so now we're at 24 reps, right? So eight times three, I have a second grader, my multiplication is really good right now. And so you, you're going to get about the same volume if you were to stick with that same load. So I think practically that tension ends up being similar uh, be, if you keep that same load because of the fatigue aspect. From a strength perspective, and I said earlier in, in our talk here that what the data show for strength and hypertrophy might be a little bit different. And that from a strength perspective, the the mechanistic reasons are a bit more sound for not training to failure. So what we see happens when there's training to failure is that because of more time under tension per set and going to failure in that longer set and more of a muscular endurance type of thing, the interconversion or the shifting of fibers or the proteins associated with those fibers go away from 2X right? More toward 2A and more toward type 1. And so the individuals tend to lose some of that strength and a power and explosiveness um, with that purely training to failure all the time. So we've seen this. There's a good study on velocity loss from Pereo Blanco, I think in 2017. It's one of the first to look at this. And so there was a small effect size in that study. They had individuals training to a 40% velocity loss, which if you're not familiar with velocity losses, let's say the first rep of the set is 1.0 meters per second, just to make the math easy, you would stop the set when you lose 40% of their velocity, meaning once that velocity hits 0 0.60, you're done, versus a 20%. Once that velocity reaches 0 0.80, the drop from 1.0, you're done. Well, the velocities didn't start at 1.0. They started you know, at a more much closer to failure. What I found was the 40% grew ended up training to failure some. When they did, the strength tended to be gained slightly lower than the group that was trained at the 20%, which was non-failure all the time. And they saw there was interconversions more away from 2X in the hypertrophy or the 40% velocity loss training to failure all the time than the 20% uh, group. And so we can conclude there that from a hypertrophy perspective, training to failure is totally fine. Maybe it's better, maybe it's not. We'll talk about that. But from a strength perspective, and every single study doesn't show this, but there are a number of studies now that do show training to failure is not better for hypertrophy, or excuse me, not better for strength, and possibly, possibly 
inferior. So I would tend to be a bit more cautious from strength and stay shy of failure because you don't want to get that inner conversion of fiber types away from the higher threshold motor units. Uh, and, and you're staying shy of failure there. You can probably get some more quality repetitions in from a technique perspective too, by staying a few reps shy of failure or a rep or two shy of failure for strength. One thing is that for strength, the most important distinction here is load on the barbell. If you want to get stronger, let's say you're interested in a 1RM. Not everybody's interested in 1RM. They just might want to increase the number of reps they can do at a moderate load. But if somebody's interested in a 1RM, if you train at 90% of 1RM and you do a single, you're already at a 1 or a 2 RIR. So you might be close to failure, but it matters why you're really close to failure at failure. If you're at failure for strength because the load is really high, that's okay. If you're at failure all the time for strength because you're just doing a ton of reps at 70% of 1RM, that's probably not the best strategy uh, for, for strength. It could help in the long term because you're getting muscle growth out of that. But then when you go to the higher loads, if you're at failure, it's okay if it's because of the load that's on the barbell. Whereas for hypertrophy, hypertrophy is going to occur mostly independent of load, right? If you get below 20% of 1RM, now that's a little bit too low for hypertrophy. But Load at moderate to high loads can all cause uh, sufficient hypertrophy there. So the question about mechanistically why I think we have to distinguish between hypertrophy and strength. Hypertrophy, it's a bit more practical why somebody might not want to train to failure. For strength, I think that mechanism uh, does exist. And I feel a bit more comfortable for strength saying, hey, it's okay to train not to failure. It may be preferable in some spots for hypertrophy, and we'll get into the data. I think it's a li little bit more up to the individual. Mm, thank you. This was very helpful uh, to understand and, and very clear. Um, now, let's actually go into the data. I'm very curious to hear where is this really um, seen in the data? Where are some, where, where some studies showing towards it, but there's mi there might be some controversy in, 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 the, in the data? Um, please. Yeah. So... <clears throat> At the, at the outset, I'll say again that I think reasonable people can disagree on the interpretation of the data and can disagree on you know, what the take-home message should be or, 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 or how they would program in practice. I'll also say that research isn't there to tell you exactly how to train. Research is there to give us concepts and ideas, and then practitioners understand those concepts and ideas and put them into practice in a way that they deem is best for them or is best for their clients. And there's a lot of other factors that go along with that, meaning is one of these strategies going to allow my client or myself to adhere to training better, to get the enjoyment out of training better? Uh, and, and does this person, because there's such a, a large inter-individual response, tend to respond better to this style of training than they do to this style of training. So I think that's the first thing uh, for all of us to understand is that research shouldn't be used to say, go and do exactly this. You will get exactly this response. It's there to give us a concept and then we put it into practice. So with that being said, we discussed the theoretical reason, the physiological reason why training to failure might be a better idea. Now, over the years, I've, I've written a lot about failure in our mass research review, and I was mostly of the opinion that training to failure, not training to failure, provided similar results. And because of that, on average, I would typically recommend not training to failure because you can stay shy of failure, not feel as wrecked, maybe recover a bit more quickly, maybe even add more volume and see similar hypertrophy, maybe even better in some spots. Um, so why would you want to train to failure unless you really enjoy it? As we talked about, of course, that's a valid reason. And then recently, uh, we had a meta-analysis come out, which was actually by our laboratory. So my student, Zach Robinson, who does phenomenal work, uh, he led the, the meta-analysis, did an absolutely great job on it. And the findings, and this is why science is so cool, uh, and I, I remember we, we worked on the project together, Zach and, and, and uh, Josh Pelland and, and Jake Remert, the guys in the lab, uh, and we found the studies and, 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 and so forth and, and broke them down. And then Zach ran the analysis and he showed me the analysis. And you can, since I was somebody who said, ah, you can probably train not to failure. 
by when I give my response here, you'll be able to kind of infer what the analysis said. Zach showed me the analysis of rather this meta regression on all of the studies training to failure, looking at a line that explains, you know, if we have uh, the number of, of RIR and the rate of muscle growth, the number that explains it. And uh, the line went up like this. And my response was, no way. There's no way. Dude, stop. Like, there's no way that's the case. And this is why science is cool, because our findings weren't in agreement with my hypothesis. And I was like, man, am I, how, how wrong am I? Like, was I that, was I that wrong? And we started to look at it. And, and I think the, the long story short is I don't think we were that wrong, but I think that the, the data, when we pulled all of the data together, it did tend to show uh, that similar to the physiological reasons or what people would, would call the effective reps, right? Training closer to failure is a bit better for muscle growth. It did tend to show a little bit of a relationship between the closer you got to failure, there was a little bit more muscle growth and perhaps training to the momentary muscular failure was a bit better. Now there's a lot of caveats to that. One was once the load was, let's say above 80%, 85%, it didn't really matter very much. Training shy failure training to failure didn't matter too much the other May caveat to give question here to to this this is um does it normalize for volume so does it assume that you're having the same volume yes yeah, so that's the exact next thing i was going to get to this is the great question and it's so paramount to discuss which is that and i alluded to this earlier a little bit as well so this is when set volume is equated and so when the number of sets that people perform over a certain number of reps are equated, this is what it seems to show. And this is, in my opinion, so important because when somebody says, is training to failure better for muscle growth? My response would be, if I just go based upon this data, right? And, and, and not one study or even one meta regression can solve the whole thing, right? Um, remember a meta regression or meta analysis is only as good as the studies that are done and included in it. And this was done very, very well. It's our work. It's my students. So I think it's done very, very well. Of course it's open to criticism. Um, but we, we feel good about the, the product that we put out, but it is when sets are equated and when volume was equated. So that's the caveat. If somebody says, well, Hey, muscle growth is, is, uh, training to failure is better for muscle growth. I say in some contexts, maybe. But if somebody were to add a set, perhaps they would get more muscle growth or similar muscle growth um, by not training to failure. So if we, if we take that, which again, I'm not saying this is true, but if we take that argument and we say that, yes, when volume is equated, that muscle growth will be a bit better when you train to failure than when you don't train to failure. The question in my mind then becomes, how many sets or how much more volume do you need to do at a two RIR to provide the same or more muscle growth than when you train to failure? And if let's say you need to provide, let's say you need to add two sets when you're training at a one RIR to provide the same muscle growth as when training to failure, then how many sets do you need to provide at, how many more sets do you need to do at a two RIR? Then how many more sets do you need to do at a three RIR? At a certain point, it becomes impractical, right? If you say, oh, I'm going to train at a 10 RIR, but I have to do 30 more sets. Why would you do that? Right. But I, I do think that's a very important question and very important distinction. There's a few other things to get into here, and I'm going to try to remember all of them, which is there are still a lot of unknown questions in that one, we shouldn't look at this as a binary decision in that, oh, I have to take all my sets to failure all of the time, or I'm not going to take any of my sets to failure any of the time. Well, what are the things that go into that? Perhaps if training to failure is better, again, I don't know for sure, but if it is, perhaps if you do four sets on an exercise, you only need to take one of those sets to failure for that to be enough of a failure stimulus. If so, that's probably good news. You could take the other three sets shy of failure, then that last one you could go all out. If it's 
if you're training, let's say that muscle group Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you could do that failure work on Friday because you have more of a break until you come back and train again on Monday. If your recovery time is a little bit longer, perhaps you need two, two of those four sets to be to failure. We don't know that yet, right? We can't say that. So I do think we shouldn't look at that as a binary decision in terms of how frequently you train to failure or not train to failure. The other reason for that is this also may be somewhat dependent practically on the exercises that you use. If I were to say to someone, hey, you're gonna squat three days a week and you're gonna do three to four sets each time at a moderate load and you're gonna go to absolute momentary muscular failure. To me, that sounds miserable. Not because I wouldn't wanna put the work in, I would be kind of happy to put the work in because it is fun, you feel great that night. But I don't think it's a very sustainable way to train. Now, if you said, hey, on the biceps curls and the triceps pushdowns, whatever, man, just do them to failure. I say, sure, not a huge deal, right? I think I can do that, I can handle that, I can knock these out. It's probably pretty fun. Might add in some drop sets, some rest pause, knock out those biceps curls, not a huge deal. So I do think practically it's dependent on that. The other practical thing that I think matters is that in, in whenever we have a training program or a specific training prescription, there's always downstream effects. What I mean by that is in this short-term study of six weeks that's published in the literature, this might show this. Program A might be better than program B. But what are the downstream effects? Meaning after each session, how did somebody feel? Did they enjoy it? What was their session rating of perceived exertion? Meaning what was their global fatigue from that time? How likely are they to continue this style of training known as intention to exercise over their next training block if this is what they had to do? And for me, that's something that isn't seen a lot or we can't tease out yet from all of this data. So if somebody always trains to failure, perhaps they have a little bit lower intention to keep training that way because it's a bit more fatiguing for them. So those downstream effects could be there. Now, some individuals might have a greater intention to exercise if they're always training to failure. So there's people that could be on both sides of that. But all of those things should come into play. And so if I circle this back around to what we said at the outset, which is anecdotally, People have seen progress by not training to failure and training to failure. And I think there's a lot of validity in that from both the physiological perspective and what the data is showing, what the data are showing, and from that psychological aspect of it, whereas some people may just very much enjoy this style of training versus that style of training. Also, some people that are training primarily for muscle growth may not historically in their programs have done a lot of these major skilled compound movements and they're training more on machines and more on single joint movements. And in those cases, training to failure isn't as big of an ask for them to do continuously as opposed to somebody who's always doing those big lifts. So there's a lot there. In short, the data and the meta regression lean a little bit in this direction, but that's on a set equated basis. So how many sets do you need to add at each RIR to be able to equalize the hypertrophy between them, I think is a very important question. And we probably shouldn't look at this in a binary way, whereas all our sets need to be to failure versus all our sets not. You could plug in, and even if you're an advocate of non-failure training, there's nothing wrong with plugging in a set of failure or two. As a coach, I would do this all the time because as I use that Monday, Wednesday, Friday setup before, on Friday, if some people like things that are quantifiable. So if we give them and say, I want you to do this last set here and they do hundred kilos for eight reps. And then a month later on their last set, their plus set, or there's many reps as possible set, they do that set to failure instead of eight reps, they do it for 12. That's measurable progress, right? Even if you're an advocate of non-failure training, there's not really a huge risk to doing one set to failure. So they get to take that measurable progress. Perhaps we can predict a new one RM from there. You can put a report together for the client and say, what a fantastic job. You added four reps over this last four weeks, six weeks, whatever it might be. So there's practical benefits to both of those. So that's a very long-winded answer. Um, I'm giving a lot of those, but I hope that was, was helpful there to kind of give a full picture of that. 
Wow, this was incredibly helpful. And if you allow me to do a simplified, maybe oversimplified summary from a this one life perspective. So thinking about if I want to optimize my life overall, so not purely on their uh, resistance training, so strength and hypertrophy perspective, um, just alone the notion that I do have the choice whether I want to train to failure or whether I want to leave repetitions in reserve is already uh, a significant revelation and value to most of the people, at least if you talk in non-professional um, athletes. And at least I personally, um, now I'm turning 40, I just, you know, my number one priority when I'm exercising is don't get injured. And for whatever reason, either it's because I s still, despite my effort, have shit form or um, it's just something within my body or it's all the different strains that I put on my body. Whenever I go for a longer period of time until and, and try to go really up to failure, um, I do start to have injuries. So that's one big reason why I love that concept. And the other one is, and that might also be a great segue into our next topic, but um, because of all the mental effort that I have to put into other areas of my life, um, entrepreneurship, but also family, I just sometimes don't feel I have it in me to go all out. So um, appreciate you giving me a scientific reason <laughs> to take that choice. A absolutely. Is it okay for you if we shift gears and jump into the topic of exercise and cognition. Thank you for listening to part one of our conversation. Part two will follow next week, where we'll do a deep dive on exercise and cognition, the surprising impact of mental fatigue on exercise performance, how you can avoid most negative effects, why resistance training alone can make you smarter, and what the best protocols are to gain the main benefits for your brain.